great. So I'm not going to go through all these details. I've, lo I've lined it up. It'll be pretty plain when we see it. But uh, because my next, uh, I always follow what I learned in industry and what I found out, uh, especially in the refining business and, and other plants, mining and that, that the safety moments are now pretty much uh, uh, expected. You know, if you're in engineering, construction, fabrication, stuff like that, and, and if you're in an office, why not? So I've got a few points made up there for people that are working in an office or even attending the webinar here now. And uh, I've done a lot of training and uh, and uh, PowerPoint and that. I'm, I'm getting a little bit more used to Zoom, but uh, uh, I've done it uh, quite a bit. Spent a lot of time on my laptop. And one, one of the things I try to do is when I'm sitting down for a webinar is to make sure that if the doorbell rings or the fire alarm goes off or the dog starts barking, that I'm ready to go. I'm not, I don't have objects down that I can trip up in or anything like that. I, I have the stove turned off. I do my little rounds before I do my webinar. Uh, obviously, I'm not going to be driving around with my iPhone and speaking on a, a, in a meeting. And uh, also, uh, you know, you can't hear your smoke alarm, perhaps, if you've got your your, your headphones on, stuff like that. Uh, posture, uh, get, you know, have your glasses and everything ready. Don't spill tea and that over yourself. And I think it's Sounds like common sense, but it's good to check that you're uh, ready to go in a in a in a webinar meeting or a presentation. Uh, introduction. Uh, uh, very thrilled that the board of directors, the Project Management Institute, Newfoundland chapter, Newfoundland Labrador, uh, have wel welcomed us to do this presentation. Uh, Laura has already introduced us. It's uh, Rick, myself, and Paul will come last in the recording. But the objectives, this is more important to me than the detailed outline. And that is, look, you can't learn all you need to know about change management in a one hour session. You can't do it in 10 hours. You can't do it in many hours. But we want to stress from what we've seen out in the industry, uh, and I've seen it a bit lately, is, is to appreciate the importance of change management and change control. A, a change order is not a five, minute dollar, uh, a five minute sheet of paper or a change request, especially if you're doing something physical out in the field and something needs to go left or right or deeper or something like that. It's not something that you just pass on to somebody, change the price and go. Uh, then the other uh, related topic is clarify engineering roles. And that is most projects or many projects anyway out there especially in industries that myself and Rick and, and, and Paul are in, uh, have, uh, have uh, professional engineers around because we're uh, the people trained and licensed and permitted to uh, look after the safety of um, loads and, and strength of materials and chemical compositions, and stuff like that. So don't forget your friendly engineer uh, who's uh, along the way in your review team in your in your change uh, control in your change management uh, make sure that they do the reviews and and give it the okay don't just widen something or thicken something or or, or you know make something longer without checking it with your engineers uh, then we're going to show uh, management of change moc a marine moc uh thanks to paul uh helping us out with a, a video pre-recorded and that'll be very interesting at the end uh, and uh, we'll see uh, 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 just a short demo plus his de demonstration of, of uh, what he's talking about, the procedure, the uh, process for doing an MOC. Um, uh, I just a little note here that I like to do. Uh, whenever I'm doing presentations about project management, because I'm an engineer too, whenever I do a presentation project management, I just want to emphasize a hint that this presentation is about project management. It's not about professional engineering and how to make something strong or big or or chemically correct or whatever so if we talk about professional engineers it's boiled around the team the project management team so it is a project management presentation with a uh, appreciation of engineers along the way and um, so what is a project change it's additions deletions and other revisions to a project and this is something i'm going to talk about in the next slide so i won't dwell on it here there are impacts with changes to projects. You have, it's not just dollars. Everybody wants to change oil oh, it's $50 more, or $50,000 more, whatever, and put that piece of paper through and we'll, we'll, we'll back charge it to somebody or we'll, we'll eat it or whatever. But you got a lot of other things 
that got to go on your sheet of paper for your uh, change request and your change order than just cost and and time. You got other physical things that got to go there if you're in this type of environment. Uh, and this is what I'm saying: do not ignore or underestimate impacts on quality, scope, safety, health, environment. Right? You can't make decisions on a change order, or change request that might cause an environmental concern and not check out the environmental feasibility of what you're trying to do. It's not just a dollar. It's 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 a physical thing quite often in these types of projects. Uh, impacts on your community, you know? So I'll, I'll talk about all this stuff uh, on the next slides. Uh, but you need a change management plan integrated with a communication plan because you gotta, you got to ask people questions about the changes. And then when the decision is made, you got to tell everybody out there that's affected by them that there's a change coming which, which what i call a change notice unless there's two people or three people and it's easily translated but generally uh, you know a change notice is quite often used uh, so uh, just to emphasize the point here uh, i got i like to use graphics i like to use pictures and that keeps people somewhat interested and uh, keeps me uh, chatting away and uh, on the left, we're looking at uh, a gate post, you know, a, 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 a steel gate post. And you got next to that, you got like a farmer's fence there. It looks like some angle iron there, uh, some more steel. It could be, could be, could be timber lumber um, in there to make a fence, uh, wooden posts, you know. And uh, if you want to change the color of those things and you're working on a project and you're a subcontractor, whatever, you're, you're doing the fence construction and you ran at a green paint warehouse and there's red paint uh, in, in your warehouse you, you can almost paint it right away without having to ask your client you know you you should but I mean if it's, it's not that big a deal if you paint a, a farmer's fence a few few posts uh, a different color you know what I mean so it's not something you're gonna you're gonna worry about but now if you go to the right uh, did somebody try to contact me? Can you hear me? So on the right, uh, we have like, a, looks like a water, looks like fire water, fi firefighting water uh, valves and, 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 and posts there. And uh, I mean, it's totally tragic to paint them the wrong color. It could be tragic. These are painted uh, for, you know, for a reason, for a very good reason. So this is something you can't, you know, you can't change without special permission and and concerns. And I know it's a very simple example, but I think it makes the point that some some changes are are somewhat trivial, but you can't just think you can color anything any color because in my next example here, I have a bunch of colors on the right, and uh, what I did, I went to the uh, ASME NCANSI have a site for a web page that uh, describes different colors for different industrial pipes and uh you know we're not going to answer all those questions there if i had a half day uh in-house webinar or something like that this would be a fun thing to to get answers from people but all of those different colors mean different things that whether it's water gas i'm just making this up now kerosene uh you know, uh, potable water, or some people say potable, but uh, could be drinking water, and fire water, or, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, could be some gases in there, you know, and some can't be next to the other. I mean, you can't take a chance that one, one pipe leaks and it's too close to another one of a different type. So this is very, very important. This could be tragic if people get this wrong. And uh, so that's just reemphasizing what the what I'm talking about here with painting gate posts on the left and painting pipes on the right, that there could be industrial uh, and critical industrial uh, usage. So it's very easy, but it's very important. So who requests changes? And basically everybody is welcome to request the changes. Now, Granted, somebody on the side of the street that wants to change to a project are going to have to go through, you know, the, the project office or whatever, some concerned citizen about the thickness of a, 
sidewalk or where a post is going in the way of parking or something like that. But, uh, you know, you got to take the feedback and they should be able to go and, and talk at least at the office and say, uh, you know, we have a concern. And, uh, but also you got the project team, you got all your designers, you got your constructors, you got your cost controllers, you've got schedulers and uh, you've got uh, people out doing the actual construction. They're saying, you know what, this is not going to fit or uh, we'll get a better fit or a nicer fit or we'll have a better uh, placement of concrete uh, if we do it this way based upon our experience. And they put a helpful uh, request in saying, you know, can't we do it from north to south instead of south to north or, you know, that sort of thing. I've heard lots of good, uh, excellent uh, feedback from people to have uh, got lots of experience and lots of knowledge. And uh, again, your project team members. So, so, you know, almost anybody, basically anybody sh should be welcome to, to input. But again, the general public should be going through the office, the project office. Uh, um, then they make change requests. And here's an example of uh, rather than the form, because there's a, a hundred billion different types of forms out there. There's no one form that somebody can say is correct or not correct for certain situations or certain companies and certain computer uh, configurations that people have at their office, whether you're using Microsoft or, or, or uh, uh, Oracle or Lord knows what kind of software they got going. Uh, you know, because a lot of this stuff that that's on paper is actually in, in, in on computer networks and computer systems. Now. So, but this is the sort of material that goes goes in there. You know, you get your administrative in, information, but it's not just description of the change, it's classification of the change. It's like if it costs more money, who's it going to cost the money of? If if I'm a contractor and uh, I feel something needs to be longer or deeper, you know, then is that something that my client should pay? You know, is that something, or is this something I'm trying to get a, a methodology going here for my construction and I have to eat it. I have to dig extra in order for me to make my forms work or something like that. So you actually have to look at it and say, who pays for this? And also who, who, who is responsible for this if it's because of a mistake? And, and, you know, so, you got to flag all your line items in there. It's not just a simple yes or no. And and then uh, if you got more than two parties, which chances are, I'd say 99% of projects now got three or four or five parties. So you got a, an owner, you got a consultant, you got a contractor, you got a subcontractor, you got specialists. The money and the impacts that you look at go up and down the line like snakes and ladders. So you're going to do up a, a pile of data saying this is one type of change request. This is another type of change request and uh, so on. So uh, here, here we go. Uh, when you uh, get a change request submitted, uh, you, 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 it shouldn't really just go to the cost person. I know it's tempting. And if you're in a hurry and so on, it shouldn't really just go to the cost or the the, uh, the you know the, the change control person and that's it i mean it, it should be reviewed by people if it's if it's got various elements in it like an environmental impact or a safety impact you, you, you almost got to assume everything has a safety impact if it's out in the field i mean never assume that there's no safety impact have an expert have a, at least a five ten minute look at it and and tick the box and and put their initials on it and say i'm okay with it you know so go through your team and uh, and see see that it's okay. And this is a good time uh, to talk about uh, the, the Project Management Institute Code of Ethics and Professional Conduct. Is that you know as a project manager we don't we take this seriously. We're certified PMPs a lot of us, and uh, you know we've we've uh, dedicated ourselves to do things right and not cause any harm, and and to do like these four values that come with the code honesty, responsibility, respect, fairness. So uh, it's, it's in my hands as a project manager. Forget, forget that I'm an engineer for now. We'll talk about that down a few more slides. But uh, as a project manager, and I can do something to put up uh, silt fence and these beautiful uh, sediment ponds. These are 
uh, a project I was working on in Nova Scotia there, and the contractor could do magic with his uh, with his uh, excavators and backhoes. He shaped up these beautiful uh, sediment ponds of a certain design and 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 clean clean rock and that. And you could see how that uh, rainwater that comes on the side before it gets down to the river in the valley, uh, it's pretty much clear. It's pretty much clean water. And the environmental people and fisheries people would come by our job and say, guys, you got a good job done there, right? So you take pride in that sort of thing. So you're the project manager. You're not necessarily an engineer. You could be, you know, the person in charge of what's going on in that, in that area. It's in your scope. And, uh, this is, this is what you do. So the change request, is not just dollars. The change request has five or six of these areas usually that that you should address and get cleared and signed off by people. So, and I think that's pretty much my whole theme of my presentation of it, of my chapter anyway. And uh, is is here's here's another good illustration. And uh, when uh, when you're classifying your uh, your change requests. You know, one might be a safety, uh, a, a change request to improve or, or, or to react to a safety concern. Uh, another one that could be the red one, let's say the yellow one could be one where the contractor uh, uh, didn't quite uh, put, install something correctly and he's got to go back and uh, go around and, and make some changes to fix it. And uh, you're going to not necessarily pay him for it. You got to talk. You know, it's not, it shouldn't come in your hands. It's, it's the guy doing work for you. And, uh, but, but you've got to change something. You've got to adjust the schedule. You've got to adjust uh, where maybe something is sitting out there in the field. And you've got, you got a line item there. It's that yellow one, and you're writing it in. So uh, you end up with all kinds of different types of uh, change request classifications. Uh, and different contractors and subcontractors and consultants and engineers. So what you end up doing is uh, is subtotaling uh, uh, these by using a database or a spreadsheet and saying, you know, this is a bunch of impacts and costs to this contractor. It's a bunch of impacts costs to another. This is a bunch of impacts and costs that actually my company's got to eat. We worked overtime because we underestimated, you know, the work we had to do for something. So we can't charge our client for it based upon our contract. So all of this stuff depends on your contracts too. So you got to have this is not just a dollar thing again. You got to go and read your contracts. You got to be very familiar with your contracts, and and and, and your and all your subs and and your clients, and uh, somebody's got to do the more magic with those colors than uh, than just uh, add up a few costs, right? You know. So uh, it's 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 tricky, but it's it's a great way to have a career if somebody's good at it. And who, who does it? And I got a little illustration here of a lady. Uh, she could be an engineer. She could be a contractor, you know, representing anyway. And she's coloring the beans because it's not the person who receives the colored beans here, right here, that uh, has a challenge because red, green, and orange, you know, you just sort it in the spreadsheet and then you go. But it's the person who decides what kind of impacts and what kind of contractors and what kind of charges and what kind of uh, schedule uh, effects it has. That's the person that really is doing change management, right? Not the person just juggling data because they already got the colors figured out. So, uh, and poor change management impacts, you know, I think it's pretty obvious. So let's go back to the code of ethics, you know, uh, 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 safety uh you just don't want anybody hurt why because you don't want anybody hurt it's an it's an intrinsic uh plus you just don't want people hurt but also it's very serious it's going to be awfully awfully big investigations and so on even if it's a, a twisted ankle let alone uh, something too serious so uh you know that's the ethical part you don't want it. You don't want bad things to happen because you don't. And uh, schedule delays, cost escalations, uh, low morale. If people aren't bit, aren't uh, organized with figuring out all those changes and 
invoicing or receiving invoices in all these different directions and being organized about it. Uh, it makes for a poor office uh, uh, environment. Uh, you know, so I think you get the picture there. Uh, we have a project change control process, which I won't do in detail because they vary so much between projects. I mean, you can go look this up anywhere on the, on the, on the internet and just Google the change control process and you'll get every university and every, uh, I don't know about nuclear power plants, but, but, uh, hydro plants and, and who, you know, especially public work stuff, municipal stuff, water, you know, uh, water treatment plants and stuff like that. Uh, and, and, and none of them have a matching change control process. Why? Because the configuration of their organization. Uh, but the basics are true, and that's these basics I got written right here. Uh, you got to identify the need for the change, start the change request, uh, have review done by the project team, not just one person and not just the money person. Uh, determine impacts of the change and then evaluate whether it's acceptable or not. You know, you don't want that silt to go in the river, or you don't want uh, the, na the neighborhood to drive five extra miles to get around a, a delayed bridge. So, uh, you know, what, what are the impacts and what are the professional responses to it? Uh, and then make sure that you got an authorization schedule because approvals up to certain dollar amounts and certain types of scope can go to the project manager or a project manager for the sub, if it's the subs work and it's not too serious and they have a project manager underneath the other general contractor and but if it goes it, there's a ladder it goes up the line so you should have a schedule of authority uh, and then when when the decisions are made you issue a change order but you can also send out change notifications if you're in design or or changing something in design uh, and you should send out either electronically or by paper and get it uh, checked that everybody's seen it, that this new change is now in effect. I'm oversimplifying it a little bit, but it's not doing anybody any good uh, going into too much detail. Uh, if we had three or four days, we could. Uh, other important change tools, uh, again, it's, it's terminology. And I'm gonna jump right to the bottom of this page here and put in a, 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 a nice word for the Canadian Construction Documents Committee. And that's a committee made up of uh, very valid stakeholders there that are putting together uh, all these tools and forms for, for contract work uh, out in the construction industry. And, uh, you know, some of these terminology, they this terminology they use, some of it they've kind of parked and said, you know, it's kind of a redundant term and so on. But you got these change requests, you got a change log, which I sort of demonstrated with the multicolor line items there. Uh, you know, you got to keep a keep track of everything. You can't just write stuff on a bubblegum wrapper and then lose it uh, on uh, on the side. You got to be very diligent with your change log, uh, your, your change order, uh, confirming what needs to be done, and change notice. And then there's other things. You go with other organizations and other types of industries. You'll have contemplated change notice, contemplated change order. You got change directives if something needs to be done real quick, uh, and change authorizations and requests for information. RFIs are used a lot of them because if you get in on mechanical, electrical, uh, process type jobs, uh, you got a lot of questions going back between the field and the engineering group. And uh, you know, can I move this lift? Can I uh, install this type of thing for the electric, the electrical system, or whatever? Uh, because there's lots of options when you're out in the field and you're, you're having to, to do uh, adjustments and, 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 and put things on certain settings. And maybe the, the installation instructions just need some clarification. So you got RFIs out there. I'm sure Rick has, has had a good uh, Olympic size uh, pile of experience at uh, all that sort of stuff. Uh, uh, change notices I just mentioned before. People got to know. You can't have people building uh, or installing or designing something going north by northeast and somebody's doing southwest and don't know that it got changed to north to northeast. You know what I mean? That's a very over, overly simple uh, example. But everybody on the team that should that needs to know should 
find out from change, uh, change notices. So I'm going to hand this over to Rick. He's going okay. Um, managing change in the design area and when you're doing engineering is is uh, difficult at times and very easy at others. But we will go to the next slide, please. There we go. We can have two sets of times in project design. One of them is in the early stages where you're deciding what to build. For instance, we were going to build a bridge over the river and now we're going to do a, a tunnel under the river. And changes can be very small and they can be very big. And the real problem you run into is what appears to be a small change has one heck of an impact. Next slide, please. Now, in the practice of engineering in Canada, there's a self-regulating body. Uh, in the US, there's a number of uh, organizations in each state, but they all have a general idea of engineer what engineering is and I think Canada has done a better job of, of getting the words out there. So if we look at yeah. the next slide. Yeah, well, before we leave the slide, uh, I'd like to say thank you to uh, uh, Bill, Bill Hunt at the Paganel Office, Professional Engineers, Geoscientist, Newfoundland, because I do take this topic kind of seriously as, as an engineer, just like Rick. And... Uh, through some of our slides and give us commentary and uh, as rick mentioned there uh, you know provincially we we, we are self-regulated bodies so so nationally we have a, an organization that we're trying to uh, standardize things you know we got some very good work done with standards and, and and so on but at this time we're still provincially a self-regulating body and we have government acts that regulate that regulate what we do uh, through uh, our association Paganel and uh, Bill and has helped me and Rick with uh, getting uh, some of this stuff uh, out there and uh, just to, just appreciation not, not not splitting hairs but just an appreciation of the engineers do you want the next okay. one Rick uh, this one we've got, this is part of the act yeah. uh, for practicing engineering and, but the practice of engineering, Yeah. this is, this is a real piece of that, that many of us don't realize that it means in Canada, reporting on, advising, evaluating, designing, and preparing plans, or it can be directing, the, like directing the construction, uh, a technical inspection, maintenance, or operation of some structure or work, work or process. And many of us in the States uh, misuse the word engineer. And it has been appropriated by a number of organizations and people that I'm the engineer on the job. Well, maybe you are, maybe you're not. I think Canada has put forth with the practices in engineering here, a good, good coverage of it. Yeah. For me as a consultant, I have to be very careful in whether I am advising to do certain engineering or whether I'm saying you really ought to look at these things or, you know, your schedule can be tweaked a bit by doing this in this order and not in that order. So it's, it's whether I'm doing engineering or not is always up in the air. So it's, it's whether I'm doing engineering or not is always up in the air. Yeah. Next slide. Now let's take a look at, at the ethical significance of, of some things that have happened. 
Many of you probably remember the 737 MAX crashes. There were two of them. And they used an angle of attack sensor. This is basically whether the plane's going up or down. And they actually had two of them. And the software just used one. And the reason that came out was the second one. Uh, there was an optional equipment package that cost money, of course, indicated that an indicator light had, uh, that a AOA, AOA had failed. Now, in the chemical business, I've done tremendous number of HAZOPs and LOPAs, layers of protection analysis. And in the layers of protection analysis, uh, well, even in the HAZOPs, we look at critical instruments and say, okay, how many inputs do we need here? How critical is this? Well, if it could crash the airplane, it seems to me that it's pretty critical, but that's my opinion. And that you would have at least two sensors, probably three for, a, a, say, a high pressure system, uh, sensors that would shut something down like a, a polyethylene reactor, for instance. Uh, you would have three sensors, two of them vote uh, and voting, meaning that two of them have to say the same thing that you're going in trouble or that you're not in trouble before the control system would act. Well, in this case, they had two, but they only used one. And a second one would have helped because the sensor failed and thought they were in a stall and overcorrected for it. And the pilots didn't understand it and uh, crashed airplanes and killed a whole lot of people. But how much of this goes back to the engineering is a lot, in my opinion. But how much of it goes to the marketing and sales in that the optional equipment package? So that's my two cents worth for the next slide. In a typical process plant, you got uh, changes that are implemented all the time. People want to do things, move it, make it better, make it run better. And they are typically proposed by a facility engineer and sometimes by a uh, operations guy operating, uh, operating tech running the plant. And when you're designing a new, new plant, it's uh, typically somebody on uh, the project team, but they're proposed by somebody on a project approved by a management of change committee and signed off by a project manager, the facility manager. Yep. We'll see. Next uh, slide. We'll see. We'll see uh, management of change uh, uh, also described in the marine section next. Okay. Um, and change order document should fully describe the change and known issues that need to be addressed. And sometimes you in a change committee discussing it, there's other things that come up uh, that people don't realize or don't understand. Uh, good example, project I was working on, I uh, was an advisor to it. I was a, the risk manager and uh, they were changing the uh, condensate tanks to steam condensate tanks to one. And they weren't increasing the volume. They were just using one tank or they originally had two. So they had half the volume. And based on it, my experience, when you blow the steam lines and use steam to blow them and clean them before you start to plant up, you use a lot more condensate than normal operations. And they had not considered that. And I, I had had it happen to me where the, the condensate system was inadequately designed. But uh, so they took that into account and looked at it. I didn't decide make a decision on it. I just pointed out the situation. But a good description of what you're doing, why you're doing it, needs to be there. And any impacts you know, and they're going to be impacts that you don't know, that you'll, somebody else will know. 
But you, yeah. you who is writing the change order or change request will not know of all of them. Yeah. That, that, that uh, reinforces the team effort, eh? Right. Yes, definitely. Next slide. Um, you've got committees, uh, whether it be in a typical operating facility or a new facility, there's different ways of, of setting up the teams and they are needed to uh, have the right folks involved. And it doesn't mean just because these are the people that are involved in it, that they're, that the MOC committee is limited to that. You should pull whoever you need into that group, even if it's on for one meeting or for one issue, but pull whoever you need in that meeting to get it covered right. And so that's important to pick the right people. You have your standard set with your, your MOC committee, but then you have it, uh, guest appearances, I guess is what you call yeah. it. Yeah. Next. Next slide. Yep. Now, design freeze, that is a, a, a process in the refinery industry in that when you're doing a project, uh, prior to the design freeze, it's usually a small team. You're putting together all of the objectives of the facility. Uh, there's not a formal change process unless you're changing products, which your product managers and everybody else has to get involved in. But the, the functional objectives of the facility have to be updated. And at some point you say, okay, this is the design. This is what we're going to go do. And we're freezing. And this is the design and is typically when you freeze the P and IDs, piping instrument drawings, so that these are set Nothing changes without the MOC process because that becomes mandatory. You have to do it so you do the changes properly so that everybody gets communicated because there's a, a usually in your MOC process, there's a, a communication to all the groups. And then there's typically at some point you have, when you're having P and ID reviews after you've done uh, some more stuff and some more thoughts and so forth, you would, would uh, go through the MOCs and make sure that all of those had been implemented on the P and IDs if they'd been approved. Next, next slide, please. Now we get into the, the as a professional engineer, the, your responsibilities and ethics commitments. Anybody got any thoughts on, on what all a professional engineer should do? Where his alliances should fall? Or a non-registered uh, non, uh, engineer or unlicensed engineer? Well, if you look at the next slide, a professional engineer, first and foremost, has duty to society. And this is, this is different than an engineer that's just working for a company. But, but first is duty to, to society, duty to the company, and then duty to the engineering profession. Now, the reason for the duty to the company typically is you are being paid by a company. And when you're not a professional engineer, your typical alliance has to be duty to come to the company. In other words, cost, schedule, things like that are important. And those are the things you should be doing is trying to keep it, uh, keep it in line with, with good engineering practice. Next slide, please. Whoops, one, two. Yeah. Yeah, I got a sensitive wheel on my. Oh, so we're okay. Well, all right, we're okay. So where we are now? Covered there. Yeah, we're. I we're would, at... Gary, let me interrupt for a second. Anybody yes. got any questions? Yeah, there you go. Be happy to throw my two cents worth in. But management of change is critical in all design and engineering projects. 
because it's, it's a communications tool and it keeps you from getting out in left field and doing something really wrong just on your whim and not realizing that other things impact it. Okay. And, and, Gary? Rick, you, and Rick, just to underline what you just said, you've done a lot of, uh, you know, uh, design and construction and construction measure project management uh, as a professional engineer. You've been heavily involved in getting uh, LNG plants and, and, and refineries and all kinds of good stuff. You've been, you've been in the trenches on that stuff. And so this is uh, a very uh, highly experienced advice you're given. Thank you. eventually worked my way up to captain on LNG tankers. Uh, since then, I have uh, worked in various places. Uh, I've been a uh, superintendent, a marine superintendent, bedding superintendent, uh, and other, quite a few other duties within uh, the, the office uh, part of the, uh, the job. Uh, several years back, I decided that I wanted to go back to sea, and I started a job as a a POAC slash, oh, excuse me. Uh, now I do do these worldwide as well, uh, but primarily we are based in the Gulf. Uh, uh, Gary, if you can uh, just set off the video for me, I would uh, I appreciate it. Okay. Okay, what you see here is an actual STS being carried out. Uh, I'm on the, obviously the ship. The, the closest one, and I'm coming alongside the other ship. Uh, I match the courses and speed, and I just come in gently on the fenders. Once in close enough, the crew will uh, send heaving lines so we can tie both ships up together with their mooring lines, at which point I will either anchor the ships if the weather is good, or we will drift and car uh, transfer cargo hoses, and then we will transfer uh, oil from, well, in this case, it's oil from one ship to the other ship, once completed, we will disconnect the hoses, uh, let go all the lines, and I will separate both ships. Uh, we do not use tugs. Uh, I'm the pilot. Over the last several years, and um, um, even sailing as master, I had a lot of dealings with MOC. Well, what is an MOC? Well, it is as what's in the title. It's a management of change. Uh, what do you need? Why do you need a man? Why do you need to manage change? Uh, well, uh, in the marine environment, is, uh, and I would assume in, in most industries as well, you need to have a, a constant record of what's being updated, what's not being updated. If procedures change or if equipment change changes, then you need to have a, a, a record of why it was done, when it was done, and how everything was implemented. Uh, the latest example that I can give you out for, for the marine environment is the installation of the new ballast water treatment systems that uh, because it would have to uh, be compatible with the existing ballast system that was on board, uh, and in addition, it's compatible with the cargo system that was on board, uh, for the simple fact that you can only uh, pump out cargo or transfer cargo as fast as you can transfer your ballast. In addition, uh, an example like this would require more than one management of change. Because uh, not only for the installation, but you will also have to uh, update your procedures on actually carrying out the operations, which again would require uh, a management of change. So in this case, that was a regulatory uh, requirement. There are other instances where it's just within a company requirement. The company could have uh, uh, a number of sister ships or identical ships uh, in which they want to keep everything centralized. And in that case, they will develop whatever procedures or changes they need for that specific group of ships. Well, why do we need to document this? Uh, that's, uh, that's a bit obvious as well. Uh, if you make a change and no one knows about it, uh, and then six months down the road, uh, a new guy joins, he will go back to doing things the way that uh, they have always done it, quote unquote, 
And that could cause uh, equipment failure, equipment damage, uh, worst case scenario, someone could get injured or even killed, depending on what the, uh, how much the, the example would be. Uh, Gary, if I could get you to switch to the slide for me. Uh, so basically, what is the process? Uh, well, first of all, if, the, if there's a change is required, it has to be identified. Now, this is going to be identified at the ground level, usually. Uh, mm -hmm. If it's identified in an office level, then uh, it will be passed down to a senior ground level mm -hmm. manager to actually investigate it to determine if we actually need to change. Uh, mm -hmm. Once the change is determined that it, it is required, we need to make a proposal. Uh, in that proposal, mm -hmm. all aspects have to be covered on how it's going to affect any other part of the operation. Other uh, operations mm -hmm. that are ongoing in the same area, especially in the marine environment, if something changes in the engine room, it could very well affect mm -hmm. uh, a multitude of other systems. Uh, once this is done, it, it got to be reviewed, obviously. So it will be reviewed by uh, uh, onboard staff if, if uh, initially, and then that review will be passed up to uh, mid, mid to senior management, where it will be reviewed again. Uh, if approved, it will be approved mm -hmm. by uh, senior management uh, and then implemented. Once implemented, then we have to uh, basically determine how we're going to make sure that everyone is actually carrying out the new chain. So if we update all procedures, uh, as I said before, uh, we do training sessions, etc., uh, that normally helps. But you will always find the old adage, especially when you're going to see a quote unquote, this is the way we've always done it and it worked before, so why isn't it going to work now? Mm -hmm. uh, that in the past was, yeah, okay, it's, uh, it was the way things were done, but uh, monitoring shipping now, everything is documented uh, and we have to follow proper procedures. So once we get uh, it implemented and get everybody on board uh, and we have a trial phase, a trial run, so uh, all personnel are aware of the change and how to work with the new change, we can then close it out. Uh, Gary, can you just, uh, next slide, please. And uh, now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, forgive me, because this slide is a bit blurry, and unfortunately, I'm on a ship at the moment, so it's uh, it's difficult for me, but it's just a, it's just a template of what, uh, what happens. Uh, as I said before, and the stages when you're going through a change, uh, if, you, if you look, come down to the second uh, second comment, you see that the arrow goes over to a third uh, a third little box that says change is not required. And then if you follow the arrow back, it just basically says you, the system is safe. Uh, the whole idea of carrying out any change is to make sure all the equipment is working correctly, procedures are followed correctly, and, and showing no damage to, to any equipment or no uh, injury to any personnel. Uh, Gary, can you change the slide for me, please? This is uh, this page here is just an example uh, of the process that would be involved if I was asked to uh, investigate a change or if I wanted to instigate a change. It, it would be some of the things that I would need to look at. Uh, again, it would depend on the, uh, the amount of the investigation that I went through would depend on what kind of change it would be. If it was just a change in procedure, then it would be quite uh, quite easy. However, if you're looking at a, an addition of equipment or uh, changing out a piece of equipment, which is for regulatory requirements, then it can be uh, uh, very uh, exhausting because uh, you will have to go through all these, especially looking at the safety aspect of how it's going to affect the operation. Uh, Next slide, Gary, please. So, uh, as I stated before, why would you have resistance? Uh, well, at sea, as sure as everyone knows, you have a, a multitude of different nationalities on board. Uh, and, and the culture is always always comes in as an issue. Uh, there, there are ships I've sailed on in the past where there was Canadians, uh, British, Americans, Indian nationals, uh, Filipino nationals, Nigerian nationals, Croatian nationals, uh, and everyone will view things differently, and, and everyone will not always agree that that is proper, uh, a 
change is, is, is actually required or if the change is required and how it should be done. Uh, so it's uh, it's quite a bit of work, especially in the marine environment. We're talking about different nationalities to get everybody on board, sure that we want to do. It. And then it goes again. It goes to the attitude, and as I said before, a quote unquote, this is the way we've always done it in the past. That is the biggest challenge uh, for people of my generation and, and, and later that they're going to see a long time. We, uh, this is where we find it the most difficult to get people to accept the, the change required. Uh, I've done things 30 years ago when I first started going to see that it was no longer an acceptable practice. Uh, however, uh, I could easily say that I, I can adapt to how the, just how the system is changing, but there are, there are numerous people out there that cannot, just don't want to adapt type of thing. Uh, Gary, next one, please. Uh, on this slide, this is just a, it's just a bit of a, or basically a bit of entertainment. Uh, what, like you know, what's wrong? What you can spot what's wrong? What changes would you would make? Uh, these are pretty simplified changes or simplified pictures, but it, it gives you the view of what we're actually talking about. Uh, an MOC is just a change. Right? You want to change something. Uh, so, in these pictures, what would you change, and how would you go about doing it? So, Paul, I'd like to ask, I'd, I'd like to sort of ask a question and sort of make a statement about the MOC. What you're describing with MOC in this particular case is during the operations of vessels, right? That, that is correct. Right, right. Now, I've seen MOCs. Yes, they need to be done for an operation of a process plant, let's say a mine or a refinery or something like that. But it's even early in the design of the floor plan and, and new layouts, new equipment being put in places that while you're doing the design to upgrade or add on to a plant, you're changing the processes, the work processes. So you need a team to do an MOC or a, a bunch of MOCs to say, well, what effect will it be to move that? piece of equipment and have a new conveyor here or a new vessel or a new, a new uh, 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 line of equipment here and there uh, in, in a plant. <clears throat> so it, it's, it's important in a project design stage too because your, your design will affect your operations. Uh, you're absolutely 100% uh, correct on that, Gary. Uh, once your initial plan is done, uh, any changes that you make to it, at any stage will require an MOC. And that MOC will need to be documented as to why you need to make the change, how it will affect the safety uh, uh, or safety of the personnel using the, using the change, and how it will affect, say, in your case, with the plant. And then if it's determined that it's required, then yes, then you proceed forward. But yeah, to answer your question, you are absolutely 100% correct. Once the first uh, the first, for lack of a better word, the first draft of, of, a, of a design is done uh, and is accepted uh, as the way to go. Any future changes to that will require an MOC. Yeah, great. So it's obviously very applicable to projects, especially certain types uh, and, uh, and, and to operations, because there is a big relationship there anyway. You know, you, you, you your operations are a result of what you actually designed and, and, and the function of your of your facility. Uh, that, you're absolutely correct, and I'll, I'll give you another example in the marine environment to back it up. Uh, what I do now with the STS is, is uh, uh, each approach is different. Uh, so, you know, you, you cannot, uh, you don't do paperwork or an MOC. For, if I come in at directly behind them or I come in at an angle, you're just making the approach. However, I'm doing it with oil tankers. If I do it with coal carriers, the approach is completely different again. Uh, you go bow to stern. So yeah, yeah, the first time the company would actually, the very first time they would do that, then they would need an MOC to state that this is a different operation and this is how it's done. It will be a bit more general because uh, navigation and maneuvering, that changes depending on uh, the conditions where you are. Uh, wind, sea, currents, uh, the people you have on board, uh, the equipment you have on board. 
but in principle, it all remains. The, it, it would remain the same. It's even though you're doing an STS, you're, it, it would be a, a different type of STS. So if you didn't have that in your procedures already, you would have to make an MOC. Excellent. Excellent. <coughs> Let me check the next slide. Again, uh, again this is. Uh, and one before, and um, basically what we're looking at here is uh, very quickly you identify the change. Uh, you do uh, some consulting or investigation, and if there's a, if there's no need for the change or the change is rejected, you just carry on with the safe operation of what they're doing. Uh, if you do need to make a change, uh, you can identify any hazards and risk assessment. Every stage of uh, of an MOC, especially. Uh, well, it doesn't matter if it's procedural or, or not, but every stage in an MOC will need to uh, identify risks. Uh, you then you would develop or revise your uh, documents, as it says here, obtain your necessary approvals. Uh, now, in your industry, Gary, I don't know how long that would take, uh, but in uh, my experience in the past, especially sailing as master, uh, so I, I instigate a change on board or uh, I uh, request the chief officer to investigate it. He will come back to me very quickly, and I will either approve or deny very quickly. However, I'm not the final stage in, in the approval process. So if I approve the change, I then send it up my I send it up the line to my management level, and that could take anywhere from days to months. Uh, now, like I say, in your industry, I I, I cannot speak to that how long it will take, yeah. but it, it is very time consuming. Yeah, it it it, it uh, in in construction and fabrication. Uh, it, 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 it depends on the, the risk element and it depends on the uh, responsibility element and, and the importance of it and so on. Uh, so it could be a minor uh, change that's uh, eas easily approved after proper approval now, you know, but very quickly, uh, you know, within a, a, an hour or two, maybe not even that, you know, uh, for a very minor thing, you know, changing the thread on a screw or something like that for attaching things or something. Uh, but it could be uh, longer, you know, for bigger uh, changes, bigger impacts, bigger responsibilities, uh, you know, bigger authority, uh, uh, giving a nod to the change, you know. Yeah, uh, that, that sounds that sounds right, Gary. It's a, it's a, it's a, it can be a beast, uh, but it's a necessary beast. Yep. Uh, if you can just uh, go on to the next slide for me. Okay, I think that's the same one. Yeah, just uh, the next yeah. slide, slide again. That's okay. the bottom. That's the bottom half. Just the. Yeah, right, there we go. That, here's your change the, register. Yeah, that's the that's the page I was looking for. Yeah. Uh, basically, what this is, ladies and gentlemen, it's a, it, it is it's a register, right? It's a, you list yeah. all your change your changes, your MOCs for that particular company, or right. that particular department is listed here. So it, it'll have its own reference number. Uh, it, obviously, it'll be dated and all that, and what the change is. So if uh, two years down the road you need to review something uh, and you haven't got the file and when the change was done, you obviously go to the register, you get the reference number, and you can go to your filing system, and however, whichever way your company does it, and you can pick up the necessary information. Uh, okay, next. so what we've got, that's the end of our, our slides. Uh, and we're just, yeah. You know, I think our friend Captain Paul Lee is uh, is got that uh, persona for television. I mean, the man dictated, uh, narrated his uh, section there while he was uh, on a ship. So uh, I'm very pleasantly surprised how uh, how that turned out. Okay, Laura, I'll uh, hand hand it back to you as the MC. That's fantastic. Really good explanation yep. of the different parts of the change. I recognize a lot of that from the industries I've worked in, including yeah. government and in various projects in IT. And yeah, uh, yeah it was very informative. Really appreciate you taking the time to present to members and, and to your guests. I've put the claim code for those of you who are tracking professional development units, such as for a PMP. You may work for your engineering credits. I'm not sure. You're welcome to try it. I believe it does carry into other disciplines. Um, I put the code in there. If anyone has any trouble using it, you can reach out to, I'll put my email in as well. It's programs at PMI and Al. 
Uh, if you have any trouble using the code, I've tested it myself and it seems like it works. Yeah. Um, but if you have any trouble, there's my email address. And Perfect. yeah, thank you again. Okay. I guess we'll, we'll right. sign out and thank you very much. Thank you.